Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 73, August 8th to August 14th, 1862. Last week, we talked about Baton Rouge and the destruction of the CSS Arkansas. We also talked a little bit about the situation in Virginia and Confederate conscription. This week, we have a couple of events, including two smaller scale battles in Missouri. We also have action in Texas, which may or may not be described as a massacre. You can be the judge. Before we really get going, though, I do have one quick announcement that the next Patreon episode should be coming out soon. The memoir we're going to be covering is Rebel Private Front and Rear, which is written by William Fletcher. Now, Fletcher is interesting because he serves initially in the Texas Brigade, so he's involved in several engagements that that unit participates in. And then he also, toward the end of the war, actually transfers to the 8th Texas Cavalry. So that was Terry's Texas Rangers when we've already talked about them in the narrative. So two famous Texas units, and he serves with both. Also has a very interesting experience and perspective on the war. So if that sounds like something that interests you, we're going to be posting that soon. Kicking things off, though, let's head to Virginia and check in with Stonewall Jackson, as well as fight the battle of Cedar Mountain. Now, we have already introduced John Pope as the new commander of the Army of Virginia. A Republican, Pope had been an aggressive general in the West. If you recall, he had taken Island Number 10 and New Madrid, and he had moved his men in a better position to attack on Corinth, not wanting to wait for the rest of Halleck's massive army. This was the kind of guy that was deemed necessary to taking out Lee and completing what McClellan started. In many ways, he was the exact opposite of the young Napoleon, who was cautious and a Democrat. With his general orders outlining the harsher treatment of civilians in northern Virginia, Pope would move to meet Lee. His target was the railroad junction of Gordonsville. To take Gordonsville would mean that Richmond's sole rail line to the west would be cut. Reinforced with Burnside, troops from western Virginia, as well as the Army of the Potomac, Pope would then be able to move on Richmond and overwhelm Lee. Lee, on the other hand, would recognize the threat. At this point, McClellan is still on the peninsula, but has begun the withdrawal of troops back north to Alexandria outside of Washington, D.C. This was going to be a race against the clock. Lee would dispatch Jackson to deal with Pope, holding Longstreet back, and Anderson being stationed at the Capitol. Jackson, and this should come as no surprise, was ready to take the fight to the enemy. Well rested as opposed to his lethargic movements and attitude, during the seven days. He would wish to stop the Union Army before they were able to get to Gordonsville, hitting them a little south of a place called Culpeper. Specifically, the battle would be fought at a place near Cedar Mountain. There would be an alternative name, the Slaughter Farm, due to a local farm on site that was owned by, you guessed it, a slaughter. Jackson could repeat his success in the valley by taking out the subordinates one by one. Stonewall was up to his old tricks and habits, however. His communication with subordinate commanders was limited, secretive of their intended destination and objectives. A.P. Hill would clash with Jackson starting on the march to Cedar Run. Hill's Light Division had been attached to Jackson and would be attached for the upcoming campaign, 
although Jackson would cut ties before the Battle of Antietam. It's actually sort of good that he does that, but we're going to get there in due time. August 9th would see Jackson's men march across the Rapidan and move on the Union line that was around Cedar Run. Nathaniel Banks had deployed some of his men there, the advance portion of Pope's army, as it shifted south toward Gordonsville. Two Confederate divisions would line up against roughly 8,000 men, giving the rebels a 2 to 1 advantage. Ewell and Winder's divisions would start the assault while A.P. Hill, with his division, was still on the way. Ewell would actually flank the Union position with two of his brigades, minus one from Jubal Early, who joined Winder and Tolliver. Banks would have his whole second corps, with two divisions deployed under Alpheus Williams and Christopher Auger. Williams practiced law in Michigan after attending Yale prior to the war. He commanded volunteer units during the war with Mexico, the experience landing him a generalship. While Williams will command divisions, he would never quite reach the rank of Major General and fully command a corps. After the war, he will serve in Congress for Michigan. Christopher Auger was a West Point graduate who had been posted along the Rappahannock during the Peninsula Campaign. So, if you remember the reinforcements that McClellan was expecting and waiting for, well, Christopher Auger would have been amongst that party, sitting across the Rappahannock near Fredericksburg. Auger will be wounded at Cedar Mountain, but would go on to command troops again under Banks at New Orleans. One brigade under George Green, which was undersized, containing a unit from the District of Columbia, would be held in reserve. Green was an engineer before the war and would be the hero of Culp's Hill at Gettysburg. Arguably, he plays a huge part in saving the Union's bacon at that battle, but that is something we will talk about next year. Henry Prince was another brigade commander who was severely wounded at the Battle of Molino del Rey during the Mexican-American War. Prince will be captured during this engagement, but would go on to continue commanding troops during the war. To start the battle, artillery would duel before any kind of attacks commenced. Charles Winder would fall mortally wounded during the barrage. Winder had been ill and actually defied doctor's orders to not go into the fight. It's probably the illness, but there were some reports that he was acting fairly erratically leading up to his mortal wounding. So whether that was his illness or whether some sort of battle fatigue, uh, we don't know. After the bombardment, the Union troops would actually attack, unknowingly taking advantage in the death of the Confederate division commander. You see, and this is where Jackson is pretty rightfully criticized, Winder was the only one who knew Jackson's plans. Augur's men, including one brigade under Prince, would specifically hit the Confederates hard under Tolliver. The right flank was almost turned, which would have caused disaster. Well-timed artillery fire and intervention on behalf of Jubal Early would save the day. Still, Samuel Crawford would hit the rebel left flank and rout two Virginia regiments. Crawford would actually attend the University of Pennsylvania's medical school. Prior to the Civil War, he served as a surgeon. When the war broke out, he would resign from his staff position and enlist as an officer. And actually, fun fact about Crawford, he's actually the surgeon at Fort Sumter when the war begins. So there's a pretty interesting list of individuals who 
are part of the garrison at Fort Sumter that do have an impact as the war progresses. Abder Doubleday was another one we talked about before, but Crawford is there serving in this medical capacity. Crawford will continue to be in our story, actually commanding a division in the Eastern Theater before the end of the war. Remarkably, Banks had disobeyed orders by attacking, but he believed he had the numerical advantage, so he would press his perceived superiority. It very nearly worked, but alas, there would be no redemption for Banks against Jackson on August 9, 1862. There had been a gap forming in the Confederate lines at a place called the Crittenden Gate, relatively in the center of their position. This was known as the Gate because it was an intersection of two roads. If the Federals under Banks could exploit it, they might rout Jackson. Troops had been diverted to meet the threat on the Rebel right, but now Crawford and his brigade, as well as that of Geary, and his Ohio troops were sweeping Thomas Garnett's men and heading straight for the opening in the Rebel line at the gate. The 46th Pennsylvania would engage Garnett's men in fierce hand-to-hand fighting during the battle. At Cedar Mountain, the 46th would actually suffer 48% casualties. Jackson would see the potentially dangerous situation and go to rally the former men under his command in the 27th Virginia. Jackson tried to draw his sword, but it was rusted and would not be removed from the scabbard. He would instead wave the scabbard over his head, as well as grab a flag from his retreating troops. Senate pointed out that this is really the only time during the war where Jackson actually draws his sword, so lack of use and lack of proper care led it to be rested and fixed inside the scabbard. This action would rally his men and well-timed reinforcements from A.P. Hill would provide fresh men for a renewed assault. Union lines would crumble at this added pressure, the retreat turning into a rout with pursuit by rebel cavalry. Banks would remove his artillery so that it would not fall into the hands of the enemy. Eventually, McDowell's men would arrive to check the rebel pursuit. Confederate cavalry, though, would actually come fairly close to capturing Pope and Banks at his nearby headquarters. Gives a good idea of just how in the dark Pope was about this action and how surprised he was that it was going as poorly as it was going. The Confederates had the field and had given a good punch in the mouth to Banks and Pope. There would be a different air over the aggressive commander following this defeat. Casualties were 2,353 for the Union and 1,338 for the Confederates. The casualties for the Union side, in terms of percentages, were fairly high. We already mentioned the 46th Pennsylvania, but Crawford's brigade in total actually suffered 50% casualties, while the brigades of Prince and John White Geary were in the approximately 30% casualty range. Halleck would grow concerned with the Confederate ability to then hit Washington. Pope's advance would be effectively halted at Cedar Mountain, as he would wait for proper reinforcements. But at that point, it would be too late, as we will see. Lee would pull Jackson back, satisfied that Pope's move toward Gordonsville had been checked. There would be more movements for Stonewall coming up, as we will see in future episodes. Even though... Lee does not necessarily lose faith in Jackson. I think Cedar Mountain is important to the Confederate morale of the army, of the government, of the public, because Jackson does not perform well during the seven days. So 
with this victory, he's able to regain some of that momentum, some of that glory, and that's going to serve him particularly well as we see here in the second Manassas campaign coming up. On August 10th, we have a massacre on the Nuches River in Texas. Now, what exactly is the scenario for this action in Texas? This particular river flows in the southern portion of the state, in case you were not aware, and meets the Gulf of Mexico at Corpus Christi, south of Houston. Now, this actually connects very well with our discussion about Confederate conscription and the opposition to being drafted into the rebel army. During that discussion, we had various pockets of resistance because of Unionist sentiments. Whether that was eastern Tennessee or the Appalachian Mountain region in North Carolina, some had legitimate gripes. It may surprise you to know that there was a group of German immigrants in central Texas. Some of this population had changed to conform more closely with the southern culture and supported secession. But most of these individuals were still of liberal-leaning stock who had immigrated to the United States following the revolutions of 1848. There were still strong federal sentiments amongst this population, so much so that it concerned the rebel government. Of course, their conscription into the rebel army was going to be doubtful. They did form a militia unit known as the 48ers, which obviously was not what the Southerners wanted to hear. Martial law was imposed in the area. As a result, two Germans were executed. This would lead a party of around 60 to want to flee into Mexico. From Mexico, they would then head to nearby New Orleans, which is still occupied by the federal troops under Benjamin Butler. The 61 Germans were pursued by a little less than 100 Texas cavalry under a Lieutenant McRae. Captain James Duff, who had instituted the martial law, dispatched this force toward the Nuches River. Surprise assault was deemed the best course of action, and the Texans attempted to set up in the early morning hours. They were actually discovered by two Germans, but still launched a series of attacks on the camp. During this fighting, several of the Germans attempted to escape, decreasing the number that was then able to defend the camp against the attack from the Texans. While some attempted, there were those who were actually able to escape, but others were hunted down and killed. Displaying the brutality of irregular warfare, some of the Germans who were wounded were actually executed by the Texans, hence the moniker of the Nuches River Massacre. 37 of the 61 were killed, as opposed to two killed and 18 wounded from the Confederate side. Of those that escaped, some of them were able to get to New Orleans and join a unit of U.S. Texas Cavalry and actually fight against the Confederates. While the Nuches River is known as a battle, it is also known as a massacre due to the execution of the wounded and subsequent hunting down of the escaped individuals. A monument would be erected in 1866 for the victims of the action. As a result, though, the Union sentiments would die down in Texas, effectively extinguished by the heavy-handed action. As mentioned, this is just an example of the sometimes brutal nature of war, and it's just a small taste of this kind of irregular conflict that's going to be erupting in many states throughout the South. On August 11th, we have continued action in Missouri, but it's a little bit of a different flavor than perhaps we have become accustomed to. Now, we've mentioned that there have been some successes in terms of recruiting efforts for rebels in Missouri, there being a good amount of men willing to join the cause, or at least willing to become a partisan. John T. Hughes was a veteran of the Mexican-American War, as well as a veteran of some of the battles already fought in Missouri. 
he was particularly successful in gathering recruits to join the Southern cause. His ranks were bolstered by guerrillas under one William Quantrill. Now, Quantrill is seen as a particularly brutal partisan leader responsible for the famous raid on Lawrence, Kansas. He was actually born originally in Ohio and then moved out west. Reportedly, he had accompanied the U.S. expedition into Mormon territory we have talked about a few episodes back. Now, it is here where it is surmised that he would link up with what we call less than reputable company. William would join up with Missouri border ruffians, so it was not a very far stretch to become a Confederate guerrilla. It's also interesting to take a deeper look at Quantrill, and he's unique in that with this irregular warfare, there is a very independent kind of attitude, but it's also very tightly knit in terms of family units, and William Quantrill didn't have a family unit, so he's this outsider that's coming in in a very unique case to participate in this conflict. It's also interesting to note that whereas with the regular Confederate Army, there is a very much a class breakdown, and William Quantrill is going to rise through the ranks pretty rapidly as a guerrilla, where he probably would not have had that opportunity within the actual Confederate Army. Under Quantrill was another guerrilla, George Todd, who will show his brutality at independence. Todd actually immigrated with his family as a young child from Canada, being of uh, Scotch descent. Eventually, he finds his way to Kansas City, where, much in the same way like Quantrill, he's going to throw in his lot with border ruffians. Now, Todd is one of those characters that there's a lot of conflicting reports about him. I've seen some sources that say that he was this brute who was barely literate, and there are other sources that say that he read a lot of books and was very well read. So it's interesting that there are two extremes, and obviously there are two different sides of the story, whether that's pro-Union or pro-Confederate sentiment, that are changing the narrative. So maybe somewhere in the middle for Todd, uh, we're, we're not really going to be able to say for sure. Now, Independence, Missouri is actually just outside of modern-day Kansas City. In August of 1862, there was a small Union garrison there made up of several companies of cavalry as well as militia. 350 would be the total number, as opposed to around 800 Confederates on their way to conduct a raid. Numbers for troop strength, as well as casualty figures, are always going to be very uncertain with Confederate non-regular forces, though, so we should always take them with a grain of salt. Hughes would be the overall commander for the raid, coming up with a plan to hit the town of Independence, as well as the army encampment. Commanding the Federals was one Lieutenant Colonel James Buell. Buell had reportedly been warned of a potential for a rebel assault, but he did not believe the reports. Confederates had infiltrated the town, so they knew very well the troop dispositions, giving them another advantage. I've seen it where Cole Younger actually was involved in intelligence gathering for the Southern supporters, but I have not been able to confirm that. On August 11th, the Confederates would successfully launch their surprise attack, pushing away any Union pickets. Quantrill would move to the town and capture the square and have Buell hold up in the bank building, which was laid to siege. A neighboring house would be set ablaze, adding to the pressure of the Union defenders, now racing against the clock before the flames could reach the bank. George Todd freed some men from the nearby jail, but finding two collaborators, one being the town sheriff, he would execute them upon release. Hughes and the other wing would sweep through the encampment, but rebels stopping to loot will give time for the cavalry to reform behind a stone wall. 
Colonel Hughes would be mortally wounded at this point, trying to assault the strong position. Buell and the Union forces would be fearful that continued resistance would lead to their subsequent executions at the hands of the raiders. Getting a guarantee that they would be treated as prisoners of war, they would surrender. Total casualties are unknown for both sides, as the whole of the Union force was captured. I have seen 14 killed, 18 wounded for the North, and 32 total casualties for the South, including Colonel Hughes. Confederate success would stall with no real follow-up on the victory. Eventually, the commands would be dispersed. Buell and another officer would be court-martialed, but nothing would come of it. They would, however, be discharged and serve no part for the rest of the war. On August 13th, we have the decimation of Poindexter's force at a place called Yellow Creek. We had talked about how Odin Guitar's men had pursued the Confederates after Moore's Mill. Guitar is actually going to be one of the better guerrilla hunters in Missouri during the war. While Poindexter had already suffered additional losses, having been hit while attempting to cross the Grand River, resulting in many casualties. The forces would catch up again with the rebels at Yellow Creek, and at the cost of two wounded men, would scatter Poindexter's force, who had at one point been probably over a thousand strong. Confederate losses as well as their numbers are unknown. Poindexter would attempt to flee, but shortly after the battle, he would be captured. This is where the option was placed on the table to execute Poindexter for being a spy, which was ultimately not carried out. One of the wounded men would have a law passed since his arm had to be amputated, giving him the right to open a store without state interference, which is an interesting development from the battle. We talked about the treatment of wounded soldiers and how not so many of them were lucky following the war. At least here, there is a bit of a feel-good story to close us out. And close it out we shall. We have had a busy week talking about Cedar Mountain. We had the battle or the massacre at Nuches River conducted against German immigrants from Texas. The first battle of Independence was fought, Independence, Missouri that is, as well as another smaller skirmish at Yellow Creek. Next week, we will take a peek into what is going on in Virginia, but the majority of the episode, we will take unraveling the complicated story that is the Dakota War of 1862, also called the Sioux Uprising. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.